Hello, welcome to Quackaloop. Thank you for being here. Today we're talking about probably one of the most ambitious fan-made projects I have ever seen. And I'm coming from a background in Kingdom Death Monster, a fan-made community that has designed a swath of content for people that love that space. We're talking about the Crimson Scales, a, yeah, fan-made giant box full of, I think, 11 brand new characters, uh, 50 plus scenarios, 100 plus items that just add supporting content to Gloomhaven. Uh, for people that love it, that fell deep into the rabbit hole and uh, wanted more content between now and when Frosthaven actually arrives to your doors. Uh, I'm here with Mutti Eisenbach. Uh, you are one of the lead designers and you're also the individual that went through the, I can only imagine, logistics headache of uh, mm -hmm. getting this actually printed and shipped. Right, yeah. So, that's going to be this conversation. We're going to talk about why you actually did this, uh, what it was like starting to collaborate and developing the characters throughout the course of the game, and of course, the madness that went into getting this available to an audience of people. You sold something like 4,000 copies? Yeah, between both printings. And uh, let me just rephrase the word that I used there, because sold isn't quite accurate, right, right, correct? Please yeah. explain the... the legal sure. network you're in that went into making this. Yeah, so I've helped organize two print runs um, that there were 4,000 participants in. Yeah. So essentially, um, I helped get the files to the print shop, get the print shop to print it, go through the prototype phase, get it shipped to the fulfillment centers, and handle all the third-party contractors throughout that process to get it so that people can just click to pre-order instead of sending it to yeah. the print shop themselves that they get it delivered to their house. You had a lot of people that were like, I would love to have this, but I'm not going to print and play and cut everything. I don't right. want to go through the logistics nightmare of like organizing and ordering it. Right, right. Can you help us? Yeah, my original intent was, here's the files. If you want to print it at home, you can. If you want to take it to a print shop, local or otherwise, go ahead. And Or if you want to play it on Tabletop Simulator, I put it up there as well. So it's completely free and accessible for everyone. But everyone um, who wanted it, at their table, um, or mostly everyone, said, I want it, and I want it professionally printed, but yeah. I'm not going through that process myself. Can you help make this happen for and us? And then, uh, from Seth Lefair's side, uh, they are aware of your product, they are yeah. super supportive of their fan communities, and as long as you're not making any profit off of what you've created, their files are for use. They're available to you all and other creators in the space to fall in love with, use, and, and share. Sure, you know? yeah, and Isaac's been incredibly supportive from day one, after putting out Gloomhaven, for people to make custom content um, in his universe. I've had the pleasure of interviewing him in his process of how to create content nice. to help me as a designer. Um, and yeah, it's as long as there's no profit involved, then yeah. he's very supportive of it, and it's been great. Cool. So we're going to have that conversation. Now, I just met you down at Origins for the first time. That was the first convention you were at. Right. And you weren't only talking about the Crimson Scales. Right. You were also showcasing for, I think, the first time in the wild, a little game called Rove. Yeah. Tell me about what Rove is, because this is quickly becoming one of my most anticipated games of the year. And just for clarity to the audience, other than inviting you up here or spending some time with you and, and this type of interaction... I have no incentive to promote this game. I really love what you all are doing, and I'm a heartthrob for indie scrappy people that, that, that like fall in love with our industry and want to make it the best place it, it can be. Um, so what is Rove? What is going on here? Sure. So I, I didn't make Crimson Scales alone, although I took the lead. There were other contributors on it as well um, who did a great deal of effort to help make it happen. And we just had so much fun going through the process. It was a lot of work, but we just enjoyed it so much that we wanted to go on and progress to make our own game. Mm -hmm. So here we have Rove. It's a fantasy campaign adventure for one to four players. You're going to go through maps, killing enemies, mm -hmm. leveling up, unlocking new classes. But it's mechanically and thematically different and standalone. And I believe we're um, tackling some unique things in the industry with our game that have never been put out in any game before. Yeah, I, I had a chance to sit down and demo this, and heart and soul, it feels like people who love Gloomhaven worked on this game, right? Like, it's a dungeon crawl. It's got right. the artwork, uh, you know, inspired by and actually done by the same artist. It's, right. It's in this world that feels vastly different to anything Gloomhaven has done. You have a, like, sentient 
you know, forest landscape that's still alive, still has right. a spirit to it. Kind of like Avatar. Yeah, yeah. In a way. Uh, but you have these, you know, asymmetric character classes with their own unique card builds. But instead of choosing between top and bottom actions, you have cards that flip. So it's more of a, a programming play, trying to figure out and sequence the right order of events. Uh, I really like this. Now, here's what I'll say. If you did not like Gloomhaven, this this might not be right for you. It might fix some of the stuff. If, if your problem was setup time, if your problem was the logistics of getting it into the play area, this actually is going to be doing a lot to solve those issues. But if you're not into the dungeon crawl, this is still going to be a dungeon crawl like all of its predecessors before. But if you liked Gloomhaven, this is going to be diving into not only some more crunchy and, for me, interesting narrative elements, but also exploring those mechanics from a fan base that have played thousands of hours, played through every existing piece of content out there, uh, and looked at what they enjoyed, and looked at what they felt like they could change or twist, right? And I'm, I'm very excited because, for me, Frosthaven's coming out soon, which is doing its own version of that, right? Like, right. learning from a predecessor and, and, and adapting into, you know, with the camps and the settlement and retirement, actually upgrading the, the, the location that you're in. And Rove is taking that kind of in a different way. Right. If anyone's earned the right to do something uh, within this category, it's, it's the people that took the time to make this monstrosity for free. Uh, that being said, let's go backwards. Where did you start? How, how did you end up uh, getting your hands on to Gloomhaven? Sure. So it was uh, during the pandemic, and uh, me and my wife had usually played lighter board games, but we wanted to take that plunge and play something a little heavier. Um, we had an upcoming holiday coming up, and we were going to spend some a lot of time together okay. by ourselves. So um, I was a little skeptical to spend that much on a board game at first because sure. I, I didn't I've never played one of that scale. We took the plunge and we fell in love with it right away. Okay, and we just plowed through the campaign. Um, we had a lot of time spending together, and we just went through it. Um, I had been dabbling in making fan made content for another game mm. um, over the last month or two before that. And then I said, all right, I've finished the Gloomhaven campaign. Now let me see if I can apply my creativity to creating a character. Mm -hmm. So I went on BGG. I messaged a few people who were active on the forum saying, hey, I've got this character idea. I've got that character idea. And they gave me feedback. No, that's terrible. That might actually turn into something. Yeah. And that's Sounds the journey like BGG, went. the first response is, yeah. no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> right, right. And then you find the support of people after, after yeah. a little bit, right? Yeah. What was it about Gloomhaven that, that had you and your wife absorbed? Because you all played through in like, Something like a month and a half, two months, right, right? Right, right, Which is very ambitious and very committed. So I, I really, it's hard to sum up one particular aspect of it. It was everything. It was leveling up and having that video game feel, but in a board game mm -hmm. where there are physical components. Um, the experience of going through dungeons, teamwork. It was a cooperative game. It wasn't just me versus her like most of the other board games we sure. played were. Um, and the progressive aspect of you know i'm playing now and now i'm playing again and i'm stronger and i'm better sure and there's new things there's secret content and so it was just a combination of all that just made us fall in love with it and why family content why why because i think there's a there's an interesting jump from i really love playing a game to i now want to see if i can design something within mm -hmm. the world that the game exists in sure what why, why is that what what is the kind of inspiration or desire there so I've always considered myself more of a creator, a creative person. Okay. And this was a great outlet for my creative juices to get flowing and see, you know, I had a lot of ideas playing through, oh, wouldn't that be cool? Oh, what if there's a character that could do that? And that was my opportunity to, to learn Gloomhaven more, uh, get really into the nitty gritty of what makes something operate functionally, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time have a creative outlet for me to put those ideas into practice. So when you started creating content, you reached out to BGG, you had a group of people that said that was a terrible idea, and then you found a few pe a few, a few, few people and a few ideas that you thought were worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. What were some of the first ones that you remember? In terms of the ideas? Yeah. What, what were some of the things that you got excited about that you started digging your teeth into? So my first few classes were, they never progressed, to put it lightly. <laughs> okay, great. My very first class was a Vermling Drake Master, okay. where he had a Vermling riding on top of a huge drake, and there was a flying mechanic where you could gain temporary flying, but it was pretty hard to balance flying in the game in such a way. Um, and I had I, an Amazon yeah. package arrive if you didn't know what that balloon is. I was like, good idea. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so, and then I, I created a few classes after that, and I, I considered those learning classes where I learned, you know, is that attack six at level one? That's unbalanced. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to keep the movement down, get an elemental flow going. So those were really my practice classes to get me into the groove of what makes a class excel, but not too strong, but strong enough where you feel like you're making your own unique difference. So what'd you, what'd you find? What were some of the, the big missteps you made and what were some of the successes you had when you started like honing your skill? The first few classes never made it to, you know, made it to the public eye. You now have, I think, eight out of the 11 mm -hmm. or something like that that yeah. are designed by you personally. Right. Um, what was the refinement that you went through as you started figuring out the design principles? So one of them was having a core mechanic for the class set down. Because um, you class, you want your class to do this and that and that, and then your class needs a weakness. Like to I just played offset. a class whose core mechanic is I'm able to give other people cards. Right, right, right. A prayer mechanic. Yeah. Heavy support character, but the the idea behind it is, wouldn't it be cool if instead of having a deck of cards where I'm playing through my own hand, I can supplement other players around the board. Exactly. Cool. And yeah, and with that character, I really wanted a support character that can scale well in any party size because mm. support generally tends to be stronger with more allies. Mm. So that class also has a unique mechanics where if you only affect one guy, you get an extra bonus. Um, so finding that kind of core mechanic of what hole do I want to fill with that character sure, and then tying it to the thematics, which is the second part of not only getting a class that has cool mechanics, but can fit into the world of Gloomhaven seamlessly as if it belongs there. Um, and they really have a strong narrative behind it that drives its actions. What were some of the mistakes you made along the way? What were some of the things where you're like, from a design side, uh, this was just a, a, a misstep and a big waste of time, but a learning lesson, I suppose. Sure. Um, so on the thematic side, I had, hadn't had that much experience with Gloomhaven, only having done it for a few months. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn, you know, I created a few characters and like, that doesn't really fit into the lore. Mm. You know, I had to learn the races better. Um, mechanically speaking, it was a lot of too many different types of actions, and it was all over the place. So really, just tightening the screws, um, so that one class, if you had to summarize what it does, you could do so in one or two sentences. Now, designing and, and bringing something like this into existence is not just a labor of love from, from typically, it's not just a labor of love from a single individual, right? Like, you, you end up connecting with other people that have okay. the same, like, desire. Sure. Uh, first off, any of them that you remember, I know you'll probably forget a few along the way. I, I forget names constantly. Uh, but feel free to, you know, give them a shout out. But then also, what was the process of kind of building a community or building a, a, a group of people that were all invested in the same, like, let's refine and, and instead of doing these separate little things on our own, let's let's make something unique and, and, and together. Because right? yeah. this took a front of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I can come up here and take all the credit, but there's no way any of this would be near the quality or quantity that it is today if I didn't get the support and feedback of the people I've connected with in the yeah. community. Um, to name a few quasi-local, that's his Discord name. He was huge and monumental and he was very encouraging and we would share feedback with each other. There's another guy, Grand Duke. He's actually now on the Adex sub team nice. as very well, cool. doing some designing. So, and there, there are a lot more people, but um, I could not have done it without them. And I connected with them through Reddit and mm -hmm. Discord. So there are people who had previously published classes mm -hmm. that I reached out to and say, hey, that looks like a good class. Can you help teach me? Cool. So I was open to getting the feedback from people of what make a class tick. Very cool. Very cool. And then you said at some point you ended up talking with Isaac. When did you start reaching out to Seth Lafair and connecting with them? And, and, and you know when did they become aware that there was this fan group uh, doing something bigger than just a one-off expansion or, or cause, cause there's a, there's a lot of people that do like right. side scenarios and like one-off questions. And mm -hmm. like you were asking initially, like, I've got this cool idea. Let's play with a few cards and get a simple little, like two level deck up and running. Right. But when did it start becoming a, a solidified idea? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I had first reached out to Isaac cause I was just so excited to share with him my first class, which okay. eventually turned into the bright spark. One of the classes. Oh, in sweet. And Scouts. Yeah. But it was originally more of a scientist. Um, that's what I called it with the placeholder name, okay. a human scientist. And I sent him a message not expecting a response, but he actually did give me a response. And he said, I don't look at custom content because I prefer ideas to be my own. Of course. But what you're doing is, you know, that was part of my mission in Gloomhaven so that people take the world and make it their own. Sure. 
Um, and that's how we started the connection. Uh, a little later, I reached out to him to say, hey, I'm part of a group that designs custom content. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that, you know, sometimes will, will be a little controversial. What's the best thing to do? Mm. So I wanted to uh, know if you can do an interview. Mm. And he agreed. You know, it took a little time because he's very busy. But um, he did end up getting on a phone call with me. Okay. And I transcripted a 30-minute interview of just yeah. a whole different list of questions of what design principles in making Gloomhaven. Did he, so has he ever looked at this content specifically like as far as you know? So at the specific classes, mm -hmm. I would believe, I would say no, but as the he package doesn't want to have that, right? You know, but as as the as the package as a whole, yes, he's he's. Have you mailed him one? Um, I want to respect the fact that he doesn't. Sure, he's not going to open the box. But if he ever wanted one, I I definitely mail him one. I mean, for my side, like even if he doesn't open the box, if I was a creator, it has it has to be neat to like mantle place or just stick this thing that like right. you inspired up yeah. onto a shelf. No, he he definitely inspired this entire journey yeah. up until where I am today in the industry. He was sort that's of been my, true for so yeah. many people in this yeah. space, right? Yeah. Like Gloomhaven set the found like I I believe Gloomhaven in some ways started its own genre of, mm -hmm. of games, like just like I think Kingdom Death did too. Like you can't have something that's such a monumental success and not have those those fingerprints or that ripple effect impact nearly everything that comes afterwards. Because right. he avoids custom content, so it doesn't influence his designs, but designers nowadays have played through his game. Mm -hmm. So like right. his game is now influencing everything oh, yeah. that comes yeah. out next. What were some of the, the high, what were some of the notes like is there anything that really stuck with you from that interview you had with him that's been like that ch either changed the way you looked at design or, or became like a foundational principle of how you all approach the the project? Yeah, he broke down a few things for me such as how he approaches stamina and card count, um, nine card classes being different than 10, 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. Um, he broke down initiatives, you know, what what he assigns to heal, summons, you know, simple things that if you really observe the game, you'd pick up on. Gotcha. But unless you were that in tune from it, a simple explanation will just say, oh, that makes sense. That's why you designed that or that. Very cool. Uh, so then you got a project done. You had a slew of classes available to people, and you started wanting to refine that. How'd you get ac access to uh, sort of the card layouts, the print, the terrain tiles? And uh, you also went through the process of reaching out to and hiring the artist. So, so what was it like taking something that was, you know, I imagine rough and tumble, print and play style until you had something that felt like it worked to a finished project with, with, with character boards and designed artwork and, and everything? Sure, there are two people. Um, they go by Crazy Guy 75 and then test them the latter of which became the graphic artist for the entire Crimson Scales. Cool. Um, they took the liberty of making templates okay. out of the assets that Isaac published. Okay. So it's pretty easy, you know, as long as you have Adobe, which I did, to open it up on Illustrator, and they had templates where you just pull down the attack and change the value, or mm. pull down the move and change the value. Uh, so that made it really accessible. And then there's this tool online called Silent Bridge. They have a website, which is a create your own scenario. Okay. So you just click, and you can populate the maps and the monsters. So it made it pretty much really easy if to take your concept and put it onto something printable. And then when it comes to uh, actually working with the artist, because all of the art here, all of that is licensed directly from the original artist of Gloomhaven. Right, yeah, correct? that's like, commissioned from Alexander. What's the deal with that? Why, why did you all go down that route? Um, and uh, I mean, in my mind, it just sounds expensive. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And I don't, I don't need to get into your personal finances or, or talk about what it actually took to do that, but like... As a fan-made project, I guess part of the dream is to have stuff that looks original and right. real, but also, like, that's that's just a lot. Yeah. So, so when did you start reaching out to Alexander? When did you start start commissioning artwork for the classes? So I saw someone else who made a class. They reached out to him because I, I never nice. even thought that would that he freelanced like that. Yeah. And so I followed suit, and it first started with, hey, you know, my one class, I just want that art for Who's that Who your one. first class that you got done Done. So the first one was the Bright Spark, then the okay. Chieftain, which is the one that, that mounts the animals, sure. um, then the Bombard, so those are all pretty novel How ideas. How cool was it to get back something that you you had created now that looked like Gloomhaven? And, and it was amazing, but what was even more amazing is I would go to Alexander and say, all right, I think it should look like A, B, and C, and yeah. he'd be like, no, 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 forget that. <laughs> D is where you want it to be. Sure. And then he, he helped design the Bombard tank. You know, I had a different vision for how that tank would look, but he knows exactly what fits into that world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything looks at home. We just yeah. got done doing a, a full gameplay, and you could not, if someone walked up, 
tell the difference between what we are doing on the table and core Gloomhaven, just original right. scenario, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Until you start noticing that none of the characters uh, are things you can find in the original box. Right. Even the way it, it plays and the way it functions, like absolutely remarkable. Hmm. Um, how well it integrates into the into the heart and soul of what I've experienced throughout Gloomhaven. Uh, so, you have a finished product. You went through the process of designing a slew of characters. How long has this been? How, how, like, how much time has been invested in just designing for fun? So it took around a year, a year and a half uh, to do my part of Crimson Scales. Um, there's a guy named Nick, goes by Nick Gadget, Nick Sims. He did the story writing for the entire campaign. Mm -hmm. So he took all the scenarios I designed and together we worked and he wrote the story for all of them. Uh, there are also a few guest class contributors that had independently started designing their own content. Okay. Then we had a conversation of, hey, do you want to join this bigger package? Sure. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about Crimson Scales is it's not just here's my stuff. It's whoever has quality stuff, let's all band together and let's, sure. let's get this out there to the players. You know, people don't want to print off one-off classes as much as they just want it's that whole package trouble. together. Yeah. Exactly. So it's been about a year and a half rewritten a full set of scenarios and lore to integrate your people. You've hired custom artwork from the original designer. You've went through the graphic design process. <clears throat> You've designed, is it 11 total classes in the box here? Mm -hmm. uh, so 11 total classes with collaboration with, with a bunch of people from Reddit and BGG. Uh, are, you, are you burnt out at this point? Like, are you, are you just kind of done exploring Gloomhaven? Like, did it ever stop being fun and you just kept going because it, it was something you'd already committed to? Oh. So there was a, a difficult time for me in the middle where I was part of this, this group and this group had a ranking process where you submit your class and then they judge it and decide if it's worthy of being played or not. Okay. Um, and I had been having fun the whole time. Like I, I, was, sure. I was going hard and I had been submitting these classes and then the feedback had started to slowly get, you know, this isn't fun. No one's going to want to play this. This shouldn't be out there. And I eventually split off from that group. Mm -hmm. But I remember turning to my wife. I'm like, you know, let me just design this for myself. Why am I going through this process if sure. this is what I'm going to have to deal with? Why am I asking? For, if, if I'm having fun, right. why am I inviting negative commentary into, like, my hobby? Yeah. And, and don't yeah. get me wrong. You know, constructive criticism sure. of, of fix course. this or that, that, that was very helpful along the way. She, then she came to me and said, no, you know, you have your eyes set on this. Finish what you started. Mm -hmm. So I pull myself together and I just continued on because I had fun why wouldn't other people have fun are you still having fun yeah like yeah, now yeah I mean there are some cl classes or scenarios where I've just play tested so many times sure that those don't excite me as much but it's still always fun especially to see the finished product and to, to see people playing and enjoying it yeah you know, that's what I wanted from the beginning I mean you just played for the first time in, in your experience with a finished copy right with us yeah because uh, you've just been doing TTS and, and physical like print and play style right, stuff right, to play test for for not only uh, what you've done here, but then also for for Rove that you're working on now, which right. is your kind of main focus. Uh, what was it like to to pull the actual components out onto the table? It was surreal, really. I felt like I was playing a game that I bought off the shelf, but mm. it was mine. You know, I helped design this. You know, with the help of others. I got it on the table and you know it just made me think of all those other groups out there who are getting their copy soon and they're going to have that same experience to start fresh get those classes and i'm just really grateful for that opportunity to be the one to, to help make that happen so let's talk about that because it is fun to design things it's fun to create characters it's fun to invest in a game that you're super passionate about what is not in my mind fun at all is going through the logistics nightmare and the headache of uh, printing, getting trays, getting cards, checking to make sure print quality looks on par, doing all the logistics and lining and cutting, getting things shipped overseas here. Like, the most miserable part of most publishers' job that everyone has struggled with for the past year or so, you were like, sure, why not? Let's, let's take on that. Let's do that project. Mm -hmm. Why did you agree to go through the process of, of, of producing an actual physical thing? Like, like, did you know what it, what it would take to actually do when you signed up for it? Or, or were you kind of going in blind and just saying, like, I'll do my best? So I hadn't initially intended on doing it, and I even put out a few polls along the way, like, hey, who wants to get it printed, organized, versus who will print it at home? Sure. And if I get it printed, you know, getting a few quotes from people, is this worth the cost for you guys? Mm-hmm. 
And along that way, I was doing a lot of research and homework and speaking, spending dozens of hours speaking to mm -hmm. people in the industry and companies that can help with that process. Um, I did learn, like, for example, one of the things that I learned from was when I initially released it, I only had a U.S. fulfillment center. Sure. So when I put it out there and there are people in Europe and Germany and all these other places and the shipping was just astronomical and there wasn't much I could do about it because in my eyes I, I got course, a fulfillment yeah. center. But and the fact that you yeah. have a fulfillment center is right. a step above. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they were angry and, and rightfully so. And um, they're like, I want to get this, but I can't. And after seeing the cost that they would pay, I understood. And I just went and as quickly as possible found another fulfillment center um, in Europe who can take the, the shipments there sure. to drop the shipping down and handle the VAT. Interesting. So that was a process that... You know, the second run is much smoother because I've, I've learned sure. all that along the way. Sure. But I always did it with the, the best intentions of, you know, how to get this game printed the best way at the lowest cost to everyone. Have you, have you had fun solving this puzzle? Like, has this been another thing that you've, you've taken on and, and enjoyed the process of? Or, or is there any part of you that's like, I, I kind of wish I never agreed to, to do the shipping or do the fulfillment or, or go through the logistics nightmare of, of especially currently, like... The world's still upside down with mm -hmm. freight and gas pricing and, and shippings. Uh, you're in a weird spot because nearly every publisher I'm talking to, all the way up to the top, is saying, like, we're, we're being destroyed on shipping. We have to go back to backers to ask for more, for more money. You know, not only are we not making profit, we're starting to lose money. And, and you're sitting here being like, I can't make profit. There's, right. no, there's no conversation about making profit. Right. Let alone, like make any of my time, money, investment, anything, you know, like... Yeah, yeah. If I had to approach this from a uh, <laughs> let-me-make-money standpoint, I'd also be sweating. Yeah. Because it is it is rough out there. But I think part of what helped us is we didn't... We weren't kick-starting and saying we're shipping in a year where there was so much fluctuation. Sure. We, um, we looked at the market currently, you know, projecting a few months out and seeing, you know, how much can it change during that time mm -hmm. with the prices already high. You know, the game wasn't cheap, not at all. Yeah. You know, it's it's got a lot of components, but at the same time, it is heavy, and shipping is, is high. And But it's uh, also yeah. not as expensive as, like, right. the cost on your website right now is like right. something like 120 or, or right. around there, right? Yeah. And then is shipping a, a lot on top of that? Yeah, so um, <coughs> there's, if you're getting it from the EU yep. Fulfillment Center, it's $50 flat rate, including yep. that. Um, and then the U.S. shipping is generally between 15 and 20 bucks. And so, like, it's not cheap, but it's also not as expensive as I, I think I would have... Like, if I've printed stuff for Kingdom Death before. Like, fan-made content mm -hmm. and, 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 like, decks of cards and stuff to run characters with. And it's... I've spent, like, $60 on a single deck of cards. Right, right. Let right. alone what you've produced. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I just think it's... I think it's daunting and remarkable what you and the team have been able to, to, to pull together um, in this. What's been the reception so far? How are, how are people, uh, you know, what's, what's been the positive and negative reception? Like, what's been the criticism so far? Where, you know, what missteps have been made? And then, like, what what's the positive reception? What, what's it been like to have people actually get it into their hands? So, in terms of the positive reception, a lot of people have played through on Tabletop Simulator. Um, and I've gotten a lot of you know, positive feedback. Sometimes someone will say, I don't like this part of this class, or sure. here's a typo here that ruined my immersion. <laughs> but sure. um, for the most part, I've been very happy with how the community has received it. And, uh, you know, people were able to see all the files before mm -hmm. they made that choice to go in. Mm -hmm. You know, there are no secrets. So if you don't like it, play it on Tabletop Simulator or, mm -hmm. or don't print it. You know, I, I'm not here to try to milk you for the money. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to help do a service. So because the community understood and appreciated that, I think they treated this project with a little more respect than a publisher coming and saying, give me your money. Sure. Yeah, it's a different conversation. In, in, terms, of, in terms of missteps along the way, like looking back at the last, you know, what, two years, year and a half plus, mm -hmm. what would you have, like, if you could have, like, preempted yourself, what would you have changed or done different or approached from a different way? Because there's a lot of people, I'm sure there's a slew of people that are watching this that want to make Gloomhaven content mm -hmm. or that want to make any fan content for, for games out there and, and figure out the logistics engine to, to produce something like this. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what warning signs did you stumble through without knowing? 
So the way I started, I started with a smaller vision and then it grew and grew and grew. Sure. You know, having that vision and that goal of what I wanted to make and doing something that was approachable and reasonable. Because if I would have started from day one saying, I'm making crimson scales, never would have happened. Never would have happened. Yeah. So keeping it small, I think, was one of the most important things I did in the beginning. Mm. Um, and there's just learning how to weed out the good from the bad when it comes to feedback. You know, it's very easy to take things personally because it's a... Uh, it's a labor of love and you put your soul in. You're vulnerable mm -hmm. when you ask people for feedback on something that you made. But just to keep in mind what to listen to and what not is one of the most critical things you can do when designing content. Very cool. That being said, you're not done. You got a second wave coming in. Are, are, are orders still available in order to get onto that or are they closed? Um, so I'm keeping it open. I, I believe today is the last day up until the, the manufacturer who's getting okay. the order says... So orders are closed yeah. by the time you're watching right. this. Right. <laughs> um, until the manufacturer says, all right, we're starting to print this, you can't add to the order. Of course. So in the meantime, as long as the manufacturer will, will say, hey, can we add 200 pieces while we figure out the artwork, mm -hmm. I'm still going to let people order because as soon as you close it, that's when everyone comes and says, I missed it. Are you... Are you open to or thinking about doing a wave three or is, is wave two kind of the, the, the sign off on this? I mean, you've, you will have delivered 4,000 plus units to, to a slew of people across the world. Um, you know, what's, what's your sense of that? So I didn't even anticipate doing a wave two. Yeah. In the beginning, I thought wave one, everyone who's following the project already got it. We're good to go. Mm -hmm. And then the email sign up list for let me know if there's another chance grew larger than the people who actually went in on the first printing. Sure. So I'd say it really depends on demand. You know, I if you have enough people yeah. sign up on your email list as right. a waiting list, right, and it crosses that threshold, right, you know, why exactly. not rev up the engines again? Sure. Yeah. I mean, with Frosthaven coming soon, I don't anticipate that happening, but I'm not closing the door on it either. Are you going to design fan-made content for Frosthaven? <laughs> <laughs> from what I hear, there's there's so much content in Frosthaven that. Sure. It's years away from most people designing anything, anything of scale. It. Yeah. But, Are you excited to play? So yeah, yeah, very yeah. excited. I I love Gloomhaven, as you know, and you should come down and hang out with us. Oh yeah, yeah. If you're yeah. gonna if you're gonna you know bury your head underneath Frosthaven for a period of time anyway, mm -hmm. um, is is the wife gonna play with play Frosthaven or did Gloomhaven was Gloomhaven enough? If I haven't burnt her out, we'll see if she's up for it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you might have burnt me out playing through everything in the original. Mm-hmm in like a pocket of a month and a half right across holidays where you have to continue dealing with nearly only yourself because COVID locked down the world yeah for a period of time uh that being said let's talk about the company let's talk about why you're at origins let's talk about what you guys are doing next so what is your thought process going into uh rove uh starting uh 8x games like wh what's what's going on here what, what, what are you and the team thinking and who's the team that you have around you Sure. So I had never intended throughout the process of creating Crimson Scales to move on and create my own game here. You never intended to print this. Right. Let's just yeah. be clear about that. You intended to make one very cute fan-made content piece. Right, yeah. right. Um, but I just enjoyed the process so much and mm -hmm. I learned so much that gave me the, the confidence I needed to start Adex Games and start tackling my own game. Um, so I... I networked um, Tustin, who did the graphics for Crimson Scales, is sure. on the team. He does a phenomenal job. Um, the graphics on Crimson Scales are just next level, and they really, I think that's one of the biggest things that sets it apart from looking fan made, from looking professional. Sure. Are those graphics? And um, we have a few people on the design team too, uh, Charles and Ty. Um, Ty, who designed one of the classes mm -hmm. in the Crimson Scales add-on. Um, we've got Nate helping with the marketing. We've got Nick helping with the social media. So we're building a good team together. Um, Alexander, who did the art for Crimson Scales, mm -hmm. and Gloomhaven is doing the art for Rove as well, with its own unique style, of course. So we, we're building a team so that we can do this efficiently, we can do what we enjoy, and that we can do it in a reasonable time frame. You know, my experience with Crimson Scales and how long it took me to build that once I had the foundation um, gives me the foresight of how long it'll take me to get this game up and running too. And what's what's the goal with Rove? Uh, I mean, it's 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 set in a, in a thematic and mechanics way um, adjacent to Gloomhaven, right? It's still a dungeon crawl. You're still mm -hmm. going through a card play and kind of exploring through this narrative, kind of choose your own adventure world. Um, what are you doing in Rove that sets it apart? What are you doing different that you think uh, an audience that, that 
you know, has spent as much time as you have in Gloomhaven will find inviting or refreshing. Sure. So it's, as you said, adjacent. You know, if you like Gloomhaven, you'll like Rove. Yep. But in terms of similarities with thematics and mechanics, there are very few beyond the fact that you're both on a map fighting guys. Um, it's got its own card-driven combat system. It's got its own level up and progressive system. Um, the setup is a bit different. We have the enemies in a book, so that way you just open the book. You have the both scenario. the map and the enemies, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Map book too. We 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 want setup to be as uh, take as little time as possible because mm. the less time you spend setting up, the more time you spend actually enjoying and playing the game. Yeah. Um, so we are doing things uh, a bit differently in terms of that as well, and the mechanics and both the thematics are both very different but similar enough where if you like the experience you had with Crimson Scales and Gloomhaven, you're bound to really like this kind of game too. When it comes to the, the world that you're exploring, because for me, theme and story and, and, and all of that is, is kind of a big big element. Now, it's 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 alien in nature, right? Like right. There's, just like Gloomhaven took RPGs or D&Ds, classic classes, and said, let's introduce things that feel familiar but are completely out of the blue. Um, I mean, you can see from the uh, the cover photo... Nothing quite looks familiar. Right. What is this world we're exploring? What is Rove when it comes to the story that you're telling? Sure. So within Rove, there are different tribes that populate um, the world. It's very, as you can see, bright, open, colorful <laughs> world where nature rules. It's one of the things that I like about it. Instead of like the dreary, you know, dreary gloom haven, which has its place, uh, I like a I like a world that's full of color. Yeah, that's yeah. Why I wear these shirts all the time. Sure, and uh, all the the creatures that you face are just wild and and massive and interesting and different. And every new experience is like, whoa, what is that? Sure. You know, when you find this new enemy to come across the board. Um, but we really are putting a heavy emphasis on the narrative, where when you read something, the decisions you make based on that matter gameplay wise. So you feel that the choices you make are monumental to the path you take throughout the campaign. Cool. Any other thoughts, any other advice, any other uh, anecdotes that we didn't dig into in terms of the creation of, of both these projects? So it's it's been amazing. The journey's been incredible. I couldn't have done it without the support of my sure. team yeah. and everyone else. And I'm, I'm really excited to put Rove out. You know, Crimson Scales is amazing, and I love it. But what we're going to be able to accomplish with Rove, I think, is just going to take everything to the next level, not just for the genre, but for the industry, too. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this has been a beneficial conversation to you. I mean, like I said at the very beginning, I am a sucker for people who are uh, driven and self-motivated and ambitious. And so uh, indie publishers doing something cool or unique or, or, or taking a step into our hobby space that I think challenges or does something that, that others aren't doing, um, you know, gets me excited. And, and this, I will stand by is probably one of the most insane things I, I've, I've came across in our space. And I think it's probably going to hold that mantle for some time. Uh, we're going to have a lot of coverage here on Rove. We're going to have coverage here on Crimson Scales. We're going to be supporting and sharing as much as we can with you as we approach the campaign uh, and as we you know, play through this story that, that they've archived and created. I already... I don't think I'm going to be able to play all the scenarios you have, but I already want to play through all the classes that you've developed. Uh, so... I'll figure out where I have the window of time. Either way, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for having a conversation with me. I kind of I kind of harassed you down at Origins. And I was like, hey, so I'm about two hours up the street. Uh, how do we talk you into coming and visiting so that I can just stick you in front of a camera? And you're like, eh, logistically, it's not going to work very well. And then you figured out how to make that possible. So I appreciate that. Whatever the case, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. We'll see you next time.